Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. Uh, for those who haven't been here the last few weeks or here for the first time, we're, we're doing this series on uh, Theravadan masters. That's the, the lineage that these teachings uh, have come from in Southeast Asia, Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka, um, Australia. And um, we and I've been using Jack Cornfield's book. Uh, I got an old edition, uh, which was called Living Buddhist Masters. It's now called Living Dharma, where he uh, put together the teachings and presented the teachings of 12 different masters, uh, all from Burma or Thailand in this book. We've gone through four so far. Um, we explored Ajahn Chah, who is Jack's teacher, uh, Mahasi Saidao, who, is, uh, who developed the, process, the practice that uh, many are familiar with, the mental noting practice at, uh, that we often teach at Spirit Rock. Um, Sunlan Saidao, the uh, heavy breathing, um, heavy breather, <laughs> benevolent heavy breather. Uh, and uh, and last time we were together, Ajahn Buddhadasa, uh, who's uh, so empty, uh, nothing to to do, nothing to have, no one to be. And uh, this week we are exploring Ajahn Neb. Let's see. I, I tried to get a picture of her off the the internet, but uh, there wasn't any. But I'll leave it here afterwards if you want to see what she's like. You couldn't be able to see from except for the close, the front row or so. But um, she has this very solid presence. And she was born, I think it was 1896 or 1897. She died in 1983. And she was... Um, um, tireless teacher, and uh, there's still a number of centers. I think there's uh, five or six Ajahn Neb centers in Thailand. Uh, she was born into uh, a family of the Thai governor in a province of northern Thailand that uh, borders Burma, uh, and she, um, at 35, started her studies, her Buddhist studies uh, in Abhidhamma, Buddhist psychology and insight meditation, and 12 years later she began teaching. Um, so, Ajahn Neb. Mm. The way that Jack put this book together, each teacher, he, he wrote a, an introduction and then he let each teacher share their own teachings, their own practice by... Um, uh, publishing Dharma talks by the teachers. So I want to share with you Ajahn Neb's words and, uh, and uh, elaborate on them. She is uncompromisingly um, going for the truth of things. And she... Um, starts out this particular talk, the development of insight, uh, talking about the difference between insight, vipassana practice, and tranquility or concentration practice. Um, and I, I think it's useful for you to hear the different teachers, their takes on concentration. Some of them are very focused on uh, concentration, um, but some say concentration isn't that necessary. And I know that different teachers come through the Bay Area. Some, you know, in the last few years, the jhanas are like the, you know, the buzzword. And the jhanas are very, they're, they're good, they're fun, they're 
uh, powerful, but as she points out, they are not what leads to freedom. Um, so they can be skillful means if used wisely, but um, they have to be used wisely. This is what she says just at the very, very beginning. Uh, there are in Buddhism two methods of mental development. One, the development of insight, vipassana. The other is the development of tranquility, shamatha. The latter aims only at concentration whereby the individual is constantly conscious of one object. Focus on the breath, uh, focus on a, an energy center, focus on uh, a colored disc. In classical Buddhist psychology, there are 40 objects to concentrate the mind, to go into uh, absorption states. Concentrate, constantly conscious of one object, and this concentration is directed along a single channel of one-pointedness until a serene tranquility is reached. This kind of mental development does not bring about an understanding of reality, nor of its cause and effect. It brings only tranquility. The development of insight, on the other hand, calls for an understanding of the truth of existence. This And this understanding of form and matter uh, form or matter and mind or mental states is the aim of the development of insight. Pitfalls of concentration. Concentration upon any one of the 40 objects cannot lead to insight because insight meditation must have the changing of mental states and matter as its object of meditation. Insight, well, I'll just read her thing. Although concentration can lead to the development of great powers of mind and extraordinary happiness, this great happiness is temporary and still very different from the application of mindfulness, which leads to nirvana, freedom. Only insight practice brings a permanent end to sorrow. So let me just um, elucidate that a bit. Concentration, you're focusing on one object and the mind gets very still, tranquil, and um, powerful. Insight, you're not, no, you're not focusing on one thing. You are noticing changing experience. And through that noticing of changing experience, freedom is possible. And I'll explain, I'll, I'll read what she says in a moment. But... You understand that if you're focusing just on one thing and you get so absorbed, you are not able to see changing experience. So it is skillful means. What you do is like you sharpen the awareness, you sharpen the mental capacities on one particular object, just like sharpening a knife, you know, on a on a wedding stone. You sharpen it on a concentration object, and then you apply that acute perception, precision of mind to notice changing experience. That's where, for classic, classically, it would, the, the jhanas or absorption states were developed for a year, two years, or longer, and then you go into vipassana practice. Uh, but particularly as we went through Mahasi Sayadaw, he was a revolutionary, and since then it's been shown by many, many people that you don't need to have those high levels of concentration before you can have enough stability of mind to notice the changing nature of experience. <clears throat> we should first understand what insight is. In brief, insight is wisdom which enables one to see that mental states and matter, matter, that is the mind and the body, are impermanent or transitory, that's called anicca, unsatisfactory or suffering, dukkha, and impersonal or not-self, anatta. What we regard as self or ego or soul on this comprehensions arising from a lack of knowledge of absolute truth. In reality, self 
is but a very rapid continuity of birth and decay of mental states and matter. Then she uh, has a, there's a, a kind of funny piece in here. She kind of pokes fun at, at all these wild claims. I've read about people who have, who having made no study of the development of, of insight, claim to see heavens and hells while closing their eyes. Others claim they can heal illnesses and that childless parents can have children by development of insight. Still others profess that by means of the development of insight they can see lottery numbers. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's more than a handful of spiritual teachers in Asia who have you know, developed some kind of powers or profess to who are very popular because they'll tell you what lottery number to pick. I don't know if people keep on coming back, but uh, anyway. Telling lottery numbers tell the future of others' lives or that they can float in the air, walk on water, penetrate the earth, render themselves transparent, or become clairvoyant or clairaudient. All of these performances are not the achievement of the development of insight and have no bearing on it. These peculiar feats may only be the effects of concentration. The sole function of insight is to destroy the defilements, that is, the things that get in the way of our clear seeing, qualities such as craving, wrong view, and ignorance. She talks about the development of wisdom. She says that you can, you can uh, develop some wisdom by hearing some, somebody talk about the teachings and reflecting on them. She says you can develop some wisdom by looking at the teachings yourself and pondering and reflecting on them. And then she talks about developing of wisdom by direct experience. Guess which one she favors. Mm. Um, she says that when we don't see the truth that everything is impermanent, unsatisfactory or suffering, and not self, we are being deceived, we're being obscured. The truth is being obscured by, um, by different Each one has its obscuration, is the cause of its obscuration. And I'll read this. It's, uh, it's so to the point that rather than me elucidate, than me just saying it, I, I want to use some of her words. Um, factors obscuring impermanence, suffering, and impersonality were explained by the Buddha. That which masks impermanence is continuity which refers to rapid change in all formations. Mental states and matter are constantly and very rapidly arising and falling away. This process happens so quickly that we're unable to perceive the arising and falling away of mental states and matter. And thus it seems that these are permanent. This is how continuity hides impermanence. She uses uh, one common illustration of going into a movie theater and you look at the picture and the frames are going so rapidly that it creates an image and a story which evokes your response. But if you slow things down or stop the projector, you see that it's one frame after another that gives the appearance of that solidity or that continuity, that um, that well, that reality, which is not reality at, at all, that there's some actual story that's happening other than the frames being rapidly moved through the, the projector. She says in the same way, our life, there is a continu appearance of continuity one moment after another, but it happens so fast, we usually can't see the discrete moments. Um, and that is one power of mindfulness to start to see in such a refined way 
it, it reminds me one time in my practice, instead of the breath just being in breath, out breath, kind of, oh, here's an in breath, here's an out breath, as discrete entities, as the perception gets more refined, it gets broken up so the breath was, if I make this simple, it's like a and one breath is really comprised of hundreds of sensations that we call breathing in. And when you start seeing that, the solidity starts to break up. Okay, what obscures suffering? The Buddha said that it was lack of concentration upon the bodily positions. Not paying attention to the body, we do not realize that mental states and matter are painful and that suffering is oppressing us at all times. We do not realize this truth. And when, we, when that happens, wrong view occurs and we see our life, mental states and matter as good and bringing happiness. Following this, the craving for happiness arises, leading to greater suffering. That this piece is the key point in her practice. Not seeing suffering because we don't have enough focus or concentration upon bodily positions. And you'll see in a moment how this plays out. I'll just uh, read the third one. What is it that prevents us from realizing impersonality? That, we're, that there's no solid sense of self. The Buddha said that it is the massing together of compounded perceptions and mental states, of mental states and matter. This gives us the opinion that mental states and matter are one whole solid mass or entity which is permanent. We are this mind-body process. It looks like Barbara or Ricardo, you know, or Sheridan from the outside, but there is, and on one level that's true, there is skin and bones and circulation going on and all of these bodily processes and thoughts and emotions happening all in a pattern, a cohesive pattern that we call me or you. But when you see it clearly, you see through that mass to um, separate out all the systems. And you see, oh, it's just bodily sensations following their own laws and thoughts and feelings. We mass them together, lump them together, and say, oh, that's me. But if you take a look, there's nowhere in there that you can point to and say, that's the essence of you. That's who you really are. By the way, I'm going, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm going on Sunday to see Body Worlds. Um, how many people have seen that? Uh, I've been, we, we, the teachers just had a meeting this week and uh, uh, Mary Grace Orr, one of the teachers, uh, said, you've got to go. It's mind-blowing. I, I, my dear friends Guy and Sally flew down to L.A. when uh, it was down in L.A. It's in San Jose. And what it is, is you see the body, real human bodies uh, that are no longer alive, um, and you see everything uh, that makes up the body. And it's uh, supposedly just a mind-boggling experience. So that really is a pointer to what he's talking about, what she's talking about, I should say. Okay. The purpose of practice. Why practice? The purpose in being aware of the position of the body is to see the inherent suffering and misery clearly. She is big on exploring dukkha. That is her um, entree point. And of those three characteristics, impermanence, un suffering, or unsatisfactoriness, and not self, different people have different avenues to the truth. 
fact, one definition of vipassana is seeing in one, seeing the truth really in one of three ways. Seeing any one of those. And some people see it through impermanence. And you can have a very profound understanding of impermanence and it takes you to the deconstruction of self. Others see directly that deconstruction and wake up. And others uh, are, um, are more inclined to the dukkha doorway, the suffering doorway. And that, that is her practice is focusing on seeing the inherent suffering and misery clearly. She doesn't make any bones about it. In other words, the requirement is to be conscious constantly of every position and movement of the body If we are not so aware, we will never realize the true extent and nature of suffering. We must exercise awareness on each movement of the body as it's taking place, as when we move to sit down, to lie down, to stand or walk. We must be aware of every such movement. And she says, as you're aware, the one important piece is to notice with a very neutral, desireless awareness. It's not like you get excited, oh, wow, I see it, or ooh, that's awful, or I want this to happen. You just are seeing it like it is. She says, we must practice um, to do, to practice insight and see clearly, we have to first destroy attachment and aversion for the object. While being mindful of mental states and matter, we have to carefully be careful, sorry, we have to be carefully watchful and mentally alert. Developing desireless awareness is the right understanding of the application of mindfulness. It's not necessary to search elsewhere to learn about things. During the practice, we must have a neutral feeling toward whatever arises. If our mind is wandering about and we do not like it wandering about, this attitude is not correct. Okay? Keep that in mind. If you've got, if you see your mind going and you say, oh darn, you just blew it. (laughs) Although, don't, Judge yourself for blowing it. Because then you've just blown it again. You just see, oh, this is happening. This is the wandering mind. Any kind of judgment or frustration or thinking it should be different and you've lost your simple awareness of what is. Mm. The correct way is to be aware of the act of wandering itself. Um, we must realize that the wandering mind is a mental state or we will mistakenly think it is I wandering about. And thus the idea of personality will remain instead of being eliminated. So that's the key point. If you have the idea, oh shoot, there I am again wandering, you've just reified a sense of self. I am wandering. If there's no you, how could you be wandering? The mind wanders. The mind is doing its own thing and and there's an awareness that knows it. But to blame yourself is to reify that sense of I and you've just gotten snagged again. When the mind is wandering and the practitioner does not want this to happen, the feeling of dislike will result. When he has the feeling of dislike, he tries to concentrate strongly so as to have a concentrated mind and stop the wandering mind. Ever have that? In other words, his mind aims at peacefulness or pleasure. He finds himself stuck, attached to tranquility. The practitioner who meditates correctly should not be creating attachment and aversion. That is, you just let things be as they are. Okay, so now the practice. (laughs) 
<clears throat> Why are we aware of our positions? So that we can realize the nature of suffering or pain. If we're not aware of a position, then that then can that position show us the truth of suffering? When changing position, if we're not aware of the old position, that the old position was painful, the new position may cover up the truth of pain. Therefore, we should be alert and wisely find the reason why we change our position. If we discover the reason before changing, then the new position will not cover up the truth of pain. When we are aware of the position at all times, we find that pain will occur after a certain period of time. And it is only then that we wish to change position. When there is pain in a position we do not like, we do not like that position. And when we do not like a position because it is no longer comfortable, any desire for that position will disappear. When the desire for a position disappears, then aversion may replace our initial attachment for that position. The emotion of aversion arises with painful feeling. As for changing position, although we once liked the old position, desire for it disappeared and instead dislike arose. When dislike enters the mind, desire will attach itself to a new position because it is comfortable. Thus, we can see that in all kinds of positions there are attachment and aversion. However, the practitioner usually does not recognize this. To be aware of a position, the practitioner should understand that before changing it, he must find out at all times why he must make that change. At times, I've asked a practitioner if he or she knows why they have to change the bodily positions. One of the replies is that he sat too long and that he just wants to change. Such reasoning as this, of course, is not correct. This reason does not in the least show the true nature of pain to the practitioner. Therefore, I must further ask the, this person why he has to change after sitting a long time. There must be some other cause or reason. It is not that after sitting for a long time, one just wants to change. One must find a more precise reason as to what it is that forces one to want to change a position. And if questioned in this manner, they will see that they were forced to change by the influence of suffering or pain. It is pain forcing the practitioner to change position at all times. Starting to get interesting. Huh? Mm. Wait a second. Oh yeah. Okay. We change positions due to pain or suffering because we're uncomfortable when we're lying down before falling asleep and we turn or change positions, we should find the reason. We must know that each time we change, it is because of pain and suffering. Changing positions to cure pain, as some people say, oh, it, it'll make me feel better, indicates that we have to remedy the situation at all times. We should not misjudge and think that the reason is to attain happiness. Oh, I just, it'll make me feel better. Since the curing of pain all the time is the same as having to take medicine constantly. It is like nursing a continuous sickness. Thus, we should not look upon nursing sickness and curing pain as being happiness at all. So, what is she saying to do? You sit in whatever position that you're in until you want to change that position. Just be sure 
you catch it. This requires a lot of presence. When you sat, anybody here, I'm just curious, anybody here uh, during the sitting tonight, um, then some people can do this. Anybody here that sat completely still and did not move through the sitting? There might be some. Well, did you notice before you moved why you moved? Actually, just here as we're sitting right now, you don't have to do anything special. Let's just sit for like a minute or so. Be still. Don't have to force it. Don't have to be stiff like a soldier. Maybe we'll sit for two minutes. And notice any impulse to change your posture. No judgment. Neutral. Just seeing what it is and notice why you change. Now, for, for two minutes, or two and a half minutes, you might find, oh, that's easy. It's nice to be still. How many people um, were absolutely still during that time? Yeah. You've been practicing for a while. Two minutes, it's a little fun. If we sat for ten minutes, you might notice a little itch here or a little... Feel like just as you're sitting here without the me in the meditative posture, just as you're sitting here, notice the different adjustments that your body makes. It's doing it all the time. You can say, "Okay, I will be still," and then kind of put the whole organism on hold, idle. Okay, disengage the clutch, as I sometimes like to say. Okay, I'll be still. But if you just notice as I'm 
talking, the slight little movements here and there. It's not that it's wrong. It's not like she's saying, oh no, you shouldn't feel that. It's just to start perceiving what is being masked all the time by those little movements. Why do we move? Because we want to. Why do we want to? Because if we say still, if you lie on a six-inch piece of foam that's perfectly set up to have no resistance, the ultimate comfort mattress, you stay there motionless, and after a while, and I tried this because when I first heard this, I said, okay, I'm going to get in the most comfortable posture I can. You'll want to move. Or else your bladder will tell you you want to move sooner or later. Mm. Now, here's the thing. You might, when I first read this, I thought, oh, well, she's like a marine sergeant. Maybe you're not supposed to move. But she says, actually, it's okay to move. This is her caveat. Okay. If we sit, yeah, the desire for uh, if we sit in order that our mind may become peaceful or stand so that our mind may, may be quiet, we are not developing insight and desire will not be destroyed. The desire for peacefulness is attachment. No matter what position we are mindful of, we must be careful to know at each moment whether defilements exist or not. Don't force yourself to sit for a long period of time nor stand for a certain length of time. If we practice like this, it is also incorrect. We must not force ourselves. If we do, all our practices are done in connection with the illusion of self. Here I am again. I'm going to do it. And this illusion will follow in all positions. Attempting to control actions in this manner cannot bring insight wisdom. In order to have insight wisdom, there must be no control or time schedules, such as holding a body position for a prescribed period of time. Simply be aware of the appropriate cause, which compels you to change positions. So it's not so excruciating, but you've got to be very attentive all the time to notice those subtle movements. And the same is true in eating. And she goes this whole thing about why we eat, see why we eat. Well, we eat because we want to eat. Yeah, we eat because we're hungry, because we're bored, because we're looking for something better. She says, if you really have correct practice, you're eating just to put fuel in your body. But to look at, at all of that without any judgment. And then she says the same thing for everything. Taking a bath, going through your daily activities, putting on your clothing. She says just be there, not only in meditation. Notice everything you do and why you're doing it. That starts opening up practice from, okay, I'll sit here and just notice to, oh, why am I going to the refrigerator now? Oh, why am I doing whatever I'm doing? If you keep looking, she says that everything will be seen to be to avoid the suffering of this moment and to go for what we think is a better moment. It's fascinating. I've, you might take a chunk of time. You might take you know, the morning or an hour or, or just a period of time and see why you do what you do. In practice at, on the retreats at Spirit Rock, there's one um, instruction that we sometimes give after all the instructions for mind-body process are given, uh, and that is noticing intention. 
you notice the impulse before you act. That is basically what she's talking about. So here you are, you notice the intention to get up from the sitting. Not that it's bad, but why are you doing it? Oh, because it's time to get up. And if you start to notice intention, you see the, the connection between the mind and the body very um, uh, starkly. So not only do you see the suffering that motivates you, but you see the body moves because the mind says, time to do something. Or the, the, the body moves automatically on its own and it has a trigger to the, to the mind and mental thoughts. And what starts to happen is the solidity of this mind-body process starts to be teased out and you see there's a thought and then there's an action that gives uh, that that thought is intending to do something. It's a very potent practice. So um, we don't have that much time. I think I'll stop here and just uh, see if there's any any questions or comments before uh, giving some suggestions for a week for this week of practice. This is the epitome of mindfulness, to notice in every moment why you're doing what you're doing. It's actually another lens of mindfulness because a lot of the other masters don't say notice why, just notice what is happening. So I, I, maybe I'll take that back. I wouldn't say necessarily epitome, but it's another lens. Okay, like Mahasi Sayadaw wouldn't say why. he just say notice, here's a sound, here's a, the breath. Here's a sensation. Here's ch -ch -ch. And as you see that, his doorway, the way I, I see it, is more impermanence. And you're seeing one thing after another, after another, after another. And that starts to become very apparent how everything is just cause and effect arising and passing, arising and passing. Her doorway, when she asks why, is going right to the, the motivation behind the action, you know, seeing suffering. Yeah, Sheridan, why don't you just uh... oh. on? Wait, wait. It's, uh, if I turn this off, that'll be on. So is she saying everything we do in life, every little action is to avoid suffering? Everything? Yeah, that's what I was gonna. I was wondering about that. You know, lest you're wondering, oh my goodness, what is this joy stuff? Doesn't sound very Buddhist, which was really a, a, a thought that I had for quite some time. Well, where does happiness fit in? The Buddha talked about happiness. He talked about happiness that's connected with wholesome states. If your happiness is dependent on the next thing to avoid or the next thing to get, it's very limiting. But he did talk about happinesses. Now, I don't know where that fits in with her theory that everything is to avoid suffering. It's a pretty dramatic take on things. Uh, but it's right there in the Buddhist teachings that cultivating wholesome states and increasing them when they arise, as long as they're not around attachment or, or aversion, then that's, that feeling of well-being is very, very skillful. And so lest you think where uh, the, the, the course about joy is about just you know, putting a smile on and saying, aren't we feeling good? It's really about cultivating wholesome states. And I'd be curious, you know, if how she would, what she thinks about wholesome states. She doesn't talk about that at all, at least in the teachings that I've, I've come across. She just sees what's motivating every movement that you do, and it's to avoid suffering. Yeah, that's 
speak out real loud. Oh, it's me. It's me. Not self? Okay. It, that's, that's a whole piece that I... Uh, I didn't, I couldn't get into, but what, where it happens, I was kind of pointing it towards the end, where, where you see the impersonality of just mind following its own operations and body following its own laws. Um, it's not that you're, just by looking at why you do what you do, you start to see the impersonality of the whole experience, that it is simply this machine that's saying, oh, now we get up, now we, now we go down. And you think that you're running the show, but you're not. You're completely at the, at the whim of your bodily unpleasantness. Does that make sense? So, and, and, and so the whole um, agent agency of I'm doing this starts to fall away. It's, it, the, the, that insight is called, um, in the different stages of insight, it's one of the earlier stages of insight, very profound stages, a stage of insight called Nama Rupa, where the uh, Nama is mind and Rupa is form, where you see through the solidity and you just see you are this mass of reactivity to to things that are happening, and that then the self starts falling away. Okay, well, it's it's uh, almost time to go. I would really, it's it's demanding, but it's fun, actually. You know, there's nobody who's who's, you know, we we don't we're not taking any sticks and and hitting people over. And although it's demanding, you can just it opens up a whole world when you start to see through that lens. Why do I do what I do? And don't take it personally. That, that's the key. Don't take it personally. If you take it personally, you just got snagged again. You're exploring the human, not only the human condition, you're exploring the, um, the, con- the characteristic of, of life, that everything is impermanent. And there is no agency to it all. And that our motivations, this is the human condition, our motivations for doing things, probably in the animal world too, for all of life, is to um, avoid suffering. And we think maximize pleasure. But to look at it through that lens it just it is very illuminating. So play around with it this week. Take a period of time and just see what that's like. Okay, so we'll, we'll have a short loving kindness meditation now that we've determined that it's all about avoiding suffering uh, we can just open our hearts for a moment because there is love and there is caring and compassion and there is equanimity and there is joy and there is clarity and wisdom and those are Beautiful qualities. Ajahn Sumedho says, the shining through of the divine. There's that too. And just to let your awareness feel the, the caring heart that's right inside there. And breathing in, the mind can go anywhere. Let it go to breathing in benevolent energy and the goodness of life, and let it fill your whole being. And let your self be surrounded as you breathe it out, radiating it out. May I see clearly the truth of things. May I Wake up and free the mind and the heart. 
may I share my love well. And then to extend thoughts of kindness to all beings in all directions. May all see through their confusion. May all understand suffering and come to the end of suffering. May all feel their goodness and share their love well. May all beings awaken to their true nature. And may our coming together be of benefit to everyone in our lives and all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.